Noah Samson's a fucking idiot. Noah? The coward, the coward Noah coward, Samson, coward. who said that he liked me in a video and then later posted like a minute long retraction in the following video. Coward, I have coward, no problem coward, with black coward, creators getting really big. However, FD signifier is a dumb fuck. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Hassan Piker is an idiot. Nobody learns anything new from Hassan. Uh, I don't believe that Hassan is capable of defending socialism as a concept. Uh, I don't think he understands it enough to, to defend it as a concept. Uh, fuck you, FD signifier. Fuck you, Noah Samson. Fuck you, Hassan Piker. Go fuck yourself. Don't be proud that you can't defend your ideas in a debate. Don't proudly exclaim to the online right and everybody watching that the left isn't and shouldn't defend their ideas. I'm sure that Noah Samson will just end up putting out another video about how debate bros are awful. And uh, with the bisexual lighting and the and everything like that. Hi everyone, welcome back to this television show. I'm Noah Sampson, your host on google.com forward slash youtube.com's best website, my channel. If you've got something that's gross or a little bit weird near you, like a garbage bag full of animal parts or something, get it out of there. Take out the trash. That's my number one health foods tip of the day for today's day. Warning, warning, alert, alert, red alert, alert. Alert! This is not an anti-debate bro video. This video is, and I hope we can improve our online conduct and get better at recognizing white supremacist structures in leftist communities video. It just so happens that in order to do this, we need to use a couple of debate bros as our Caucasian punching bags. But they won't mind. As a matter of fact, they like it. They love it even. They love it when this happens to them, and we love to see it. This video is sponsored by White on White Crime. I'm here to correct the record on some falsehoods that are being spread around the D-boy zone, and also expand on my own personal criticisms of these spaces. I personally, and you can shit on the top of my head for saying this, but I personally think that people like Vosh have the ability to do a lot of good with their platforms. Teaching young people how to use arguments and rhetoric to push back against their nine o'clock bedtimes for reasons not unrelated to gaming. Spreading socialism with discord characteristics across the globe. No, but seriously, I do appreciate what he and other members of the live streaming community do. It's a different skill set that's uh, important to have and denigrating this community from the outside is uh, the last thing that I wanna do. That being said, there are some clear problems with the way that debate spaces operate that will only continue to arise until they are properly addressed. So that's why I'm here. I can fix them. Obviously that's not gonna happen, but you know what they say, shoot for the moon, and when the bullet travels back to Earth, and you'll kill a teenager in a nearby town. I've brought a friend along with me for today's video. Why don't you come on out, buddy? Whoa, hey everybody, it's me, Good Faith Gary. This is Good Faith Gary. Everyone say hello. Howdy, y'all. No, not you. I'm telling them to say hello to you. Oh, my bad. Wait, Gary, aren't you just Clippy from the Windows thing? I don't know who that is. I'm pretty sure you are, like that animated Microsoft. My name's Gary, so it's on my birth certificate. Okay, well, I've brought Good Faith Gary in to help us out by stepping in if I ever start acting in what debate streamers might deem bad faith. I'm gonna be looking out for any uncharitable, straw man, poisoning of the well style situations. Hopefully this will help keep the dialogue open, because honestly I don't trust myself enough to not be a dick to viewers of debate streamers, even though I used to be one of them. Yeah, you've been on leftist Twitter for a little too long, huh? Right. I'm Good Faith Gary and I love to engage. Okay, man. Setting up shop in the marketplace of ideas. You can go now, but just ping me if you need to interject, okay? Alrighty. Good faith to you and yours. Anyways, if you're a streamer that's watching this live right now, I forbid you from pausing this video to pick at me like a scab and go, me, 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 me. You're going to keep this video playing and you're going to like it. I'm just joking, but if you do need to pause, now would be a great time while I have my Patreon link on the screen. Go refill your nuggies and warm milky and pay me some money, okay? I'm doing God's work. Organized religion moment. I'm like the white Joel Austin. Why is that in the script? Come on. <laughs> All right, thanks. Time to go. Fuck you. <laughs> I had been spending the last month or so working on a couple different scripts for videos when the following clip was brought to my attention last week. It's from a video by the leftist streamer and YouTuber Xander Hall titled Why LeftTube is Dying and the Next Anti-SJW Wave is Rising. Oh no, this situation sounds dire. We better take a look, see what's going on. You'll notice, and we talked about this earlier, there are some people online in the political scene right now that are left wing that are growing and are doing well. Many of the creators that are really blowing up right now are newer essay, commentary, bisexual lighting YouTubers. 
good example of this is Noah Samson. We just did a segment earlier covering. Oh, hey, that's me. Noah Samson and how he's actually a dumb f Oh, God damn it. That dude is literally gaining 4,000 subs a day right now. And this worries me. I am worried about channels like Noah Samson and people like Hassan blowing up on YouTube because they're stupid and they can't defend their positions. Now, here's where I paused the video and thought, Tom Hardy GIF from Mad Max Fury Road. That's bait, right? Has to be. Or maybe it's a performance. Like somebody forced an AI to watch debate streams for a year straight and then had it write a manifesto. And then microwaved Eminem for 20 seconds and had him read it at gunpoint. Can't defend their positions. So I kept watching the video because, you know, I support small gamers. And that's when I saw this. Xander Hall responds to a message in the chat that mentions several popular black leftist creators by name, some of whom are relatively new to YouTube. Try giving more examples, lol. Progressive slash leftist channels by black creators have been getting really big this past year, for example. I'm so glad you brought this up. I'm so glad you brought this up because some of the examples you list here, I know, I know these people, and they're exactly the problem I'm talking about. These people, sorry, what was I have no problem with black creators getting really big. However, let me check something really quick. FD signifier is a dumb fuck. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. Okay, so he's definitely doing a little bit of trolling. Why else would someone say something like that about FD signifier of all people? The final boss of the wise uncles of YouTube.com. If he isn't baiting us for hate clicks here and has just deemed himself the racial arbiter of who's allowed to make left-wing YouTube content, then that's not much better, is it? Nope. Oh, I'm fine with black people coming onto left tube. But I have some conditions. Seems pretty weird. Earlier in this stream, he goes over how his channel is, uh, well, dying. It's a pretty unfortunate segment, but I assumed at this point him lashing out here had something to do with that. But eventually he gets to a claim of sorts. He's gonna be on the screen for a little while, so just a heads up, if a radiation sickness warning shows up on your HUD, um, you should probably just pause the video and go take a shower. FD signifier is a dumb f I was iffy on him for a while. He's been shit talking the debate bro thing for a while now. Uh, he's also gone on Twitter and said some dumb f shit about like bread tube debate bros and stuff like that. Here's the thing. People like FD signifier, Noah Sam, these all have one thing in common. They hate and non-stop shit talk debate bros. They'll just shit talk the concept of being a debate bro and claim that debate bros are oh, all toxic assholes, gross. assholes who make the left worse. You're starting to see that rhetoric get really popular among the left right now. You guys notice how everyone I meet and interact with in my life ends up calling me an asshole? It's so weird. That rhetoric is getting really popular right now. Whoever's doing that, we gotta stop. No. Okay, sorry, here, let's let him finish making his point. Do you think that the left online would do better with people like Hassan and Noah Sampson and FD Signifier being the largest figures on it? The types of people who say debate is bad, who literally say debating is bad, people who literally as a concept are against debate and defending your ideas, and they publicly say so. Do you think that this is what we want representing the left? Okay, so Xander Hall says that Hassan, Feek, and I are, as a concept, against debate and defending our ideas, and goes on to conclude that this will inevitably end in a weakening of the online left because... I'm starting to see the online left turn into what it was back during the Gamergate era. One of the biggest common talking points from the right during this era was the left was too afraid to debate and defend their positions. That's why Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro blew up so much is because they debated and they didn't debate well and they weren't telling the truth. They just debated. Just the fact they were willing to debate gave them more credibility than the left because nobody on the left wanted to debate. Yes, famously credible intellectuals Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro. You must be a biological boy to be a boy scout. You have to be a boy to be a boy scout. While you're putting your finger in the little it's hole. rubber. So where is Zan Man getting this impression about us? Well, I have a few ideas. I've gathered some clips together of criticisms made about debate bros by the people he's mentioned. These are things that I both agree with and think may be the source of this characterization. Sorry if this is a bit tedious, but I think it could be potentially helpful to have all of these critiques sort of compiled here. To give a little context as to the state of this riveting discourse, during a recent live stream, Hassan voiced some criticisms about the debate bros fear and the audiences it tends to cultivate. I agree, but I also see the downside of never having your viewpoints challenged with opposing views. Yawn. Okay, here's the thing. This notion that you are having your opinions challenged in the marketplace of ideas is a silly one. That would make Ben Shapiro the 
most intelligent person on the internet. Hey, you're not a man if you think you're a man. And if I call you a moose, are you suddenly a moose? This okay, is I why your... I absolutely fucking despise debate bros because you don't care about the actual morality behind the ideology that you I supposedly believe in. You don't care about the PJ outcomes. You do not have like a well-grounded materialist perspective on issues. You are simply going towards who is the most powerful intellectual gladiator. FT Signifiers Break Bread is a video that covers the history and current state of bread tube or left tube and the barriers posed to non-white creators on this platform. There's a section in this video that had some things to say about debate bros. Let's take a look at a clip. And this problem with debate bros and their fandom who understand make up a very significant chunk of left tube viewing, including my own, is the problem of most white left tube, both creators and consumers, which is for all of the theory and research and outward rejection of white supremacy on paper, the vast majority have not taken the time to dismantle the white racial frame through which they see the world. So even with the best intentions, the behavior and viewpoints born out of this space is still going to be rooted in racist frameworks unless the concept of whiteness is addressed. Essentially, if you read Marx and Trotsky and Gramsci and what you want to do ski and whomever else, but not Du Bois, Fanon, Hooks, Crenshaw, etc you might be a leftist white supremacist. And thus, this colors the nature of leftist content and inadvertently makes things dangerous for the marginalized voices that get caught in the wake of this highly toxic, highly negative energy. If that last part sounded oddly specific, don't worry, we'll get to that. Foreshadowing is a narrative technique when you talk about something and you talk about it again later. My most vocal criticism of Debate Bros came in the follow-up video to my left tube guide with a section on Debate Bros. Not gonna lie, I wrote that script in about an hour, so not my cleanest work. I also played some out of context clips of Vosh. Um, it was meant to be a joke, but it ended up just being me playing out of context clips of Vosh. So to the gamer gods, I formed Formally and humbly apologize. To repent for my clip chimping sins, I will be live streaming Dark Souls this week, so make sure to press subscribe and hit that fucking bell, you s you piece of shit, you little shit worm. But the point of that section was to document some of the problems with debate bros that I had missed in my initial video, where I promoted a bunch of people, some of them rather uncritically. My main points were don't rely on debate streamers as your sole source of information, and don't take anything your gamer of choice says at face value. And these are things that I stand by. They're also particularly relevant to today's video. Now, when Xander Hall takes what we've said here and elevates it to the claim that we are against debate as a concept, well, this is just not true. I'm gonna play some clips that refute this point now. Again, incredibly tedious, I apologize, but potentially helpful for context and also to prove that we are coming in good faith when we criticize debate bros. Pandering to the good faith gaze, if you will. Here is Hassan from that same segment of his stream where he acknowledges the utility of debate. I'm not saying that like there is no value to responding or learning and recognizing the talking points that right-wingers engage in. Of course there is. People especially right-wingers in general, love to arm themselves with the same talking points that they're disseminating out of think tanks. Unless you're talking to like a total dumbass right-winger, you're gonna hear some fucking takes that you will hear from Ben Shapiro verbatim. So there is value to learning what those talking points are and understanding why they're fucking stupid. Here is Feek opening the debate bro section in Break Bread with some concessions. And to be fair, if I had it in me to watch the three and four hour streams of these guys talking and playing video games, I doubt I would have anything negative to say about 95% of what they do on stream. And I understand that when you're talking for that long, you're liable to say some things that maybe you wish you hadn't have said. I don't individually think that these are bad people or even that they need to be ousted from the left. I think that that very concept of ousting people is part of the problem, really. Look at all that good faith. So much good faith. You're not even gonna believe how much faith is good in there. Good faith all the time. One of the things I hear thrown around the debate zone a lot is the concept of the left having a diversity of tactics. So different styles of content for different audiences, all with the intent of spreading leftism as far and wide as possible. And on a macro lens, the better we are at making this content, the more views it gets, and the wider audiences are cultivated, the better off we will be. Because this will mean less people gravitating towards right-wing content and more people learning about socialism. And that all sounds good to me. No notes. I am so proud of you. Thanks. 
Okay, well, one note. Uh, is what we do on here an actual political force, or is it entertainment? If so, how can that be quantified? If not, just how much are we overvaluing our utility to society beyond carving out a new consumer demographic of leftist content? If the style of leftism I want to promote is different than your style, and it's a style that you don't like, is this going to be an issue? Are you going to use your large platform to strike me down? Noah, you're vague posting. Are all forms of content equal when it comes to learning? Noah, stop it. So many questions, no answers for now. Okay, that was weird, man. What, have you never heard of the Socratic method? Oh, okay, yeah. Never mind, I like it. I like that a whole lot. Okay. Ugh, that's so good. All right. Oh my god. Cooking up your brain. Briefly, I would like to take a deep dive into an interaction I had recently that I think might be helpful for illustrating some of the problems with online communication, specifically regarding the topic of debate. It's a little detour, but stay with me, okay? I'm gonna get better at writing one day. My ADHD pills are in the mail. So I tweeted this a few weeks ago, saying that basically, I do not think white genocide is something that we should be debating. The long debunked white supremacist talking point about the white population being eradicated through immigration. Gary, I need you. Hey, y'all. Explain to them why this tweet is a problem for you and your people over there. Gladly. In the debate sphere, there's a conception of the archetypal Twitter lefty that says things like, human rights aren't up for debate, or it's not my job to educate you. This, in our minds, inhibits the left's ability to argue for concrete policy positions because if we can't have difficult conversations, we can't solve difficult problems. This might have been what Xander Hall was referencing when he was talking about you being unwilling to debate. This tweet plays into that stereotype and makes you look really dumb. That's me quoting them. I don't I don't think you're dumb. No, I think you're a nice enough guy. Thanks, G uh, Gary. Maybe it'll be useful if you just clarify what you meant here. Sure, Gary. Sounds good. As long as racist and fascist and other bad ideas exist, they should be challenged. Whether that's through debate, essays, one-on-one -on -one communication, iMessage, Tinder, Hinge, no writing it on the ground in the woods, whatever. Someone pointed out the fact that Tucker Carlson goes on his show every night and uses white genocide rhetoric for hours on end in front of millions of people. That's a good point. It's not like it's not happening. As much as I'd love to be able to say white genocide doesn't exist and be done with it, because it doesn't, I recognize that for other people in different areas of the political spectrum, it's not that simple, especially in the general American population. We still got a lot of work to do getting them caught up. Here's the original image that led me to tweeting this. This image to me is what social sociologists might call sussy wussy. Two white dudes on a live stream titled Debating White Genocide. Racism, is it really that bad? Noah, I can understand why this looks problematic to you, but the thing is, those dudes were actually providing arguments against it. Right. And that's good, right? Yeah. Somebody's gotta do it. I suppose that's true. However, my disdain for the idea of still having to debate things like white genocide comes from somewhere. Mainly, it comes from the part of me that feels like the real world significance of de-radicalization by YouTube content has a tendency to be overstated online. Or to put it another way, converting to leftism by consuming debate content can come with certain side effects. <laughs> You might have had a de-radicalization experience thanks to someone like Vosh or Destiny or even Xander Hall, God help you. And that's great. Seriously, I'm not here to knock on that. The less alt-right, the better. But my concern is that by staying in these spaces, it becomes easy to maintain habits of consumption that can inhibit your ability to recognize the reactionary tendencies that you or the people around you might still hold. Noah, echo chamber characteristics can be found in any online community, right? That's the basis of how they form, by bringing like-minded people together. There will always be issues like the ones that you mentioned. That's true, but the debate bro ozone echo chambers seem to have a uniquely grating effect due to their highly charged environments, massive platforms, and self-appointed status as the gladiators of online anti-fascism. One of the biggest problems back in 2014 to 2016 is there were no lefties online who weren't, you know, insane to say, no, we don't actually believe that all white people are evil and, and we don't want to do this, this, and this that you claim you want to do. It wasn't until people like Destiny and Vaughn and me and, and Chud Logic and Demon Mama and just like oh! left wing debate people came along that argued against those effectively that you really started to see that narrative start to get pushed down. There are a few examples I could use here to illustrate my point, but why don't we start with Xander Hall? Sorry, guy. There's a new lol cow in town and it isn't a feminist gaming journalist this time. It's you, Xan, Xander, Alexander Hallia Ocasio Cortez. Sorry.
It's not funny at all, actually. The most viewed video on Xander Hall's channel is called How I Fell Down the Alt-Right Pipeline and Escaped. It's from December of 2019. We've seen this story before, but basically, he got into some pepe shenanigans with his gamer friends and was eventually pulled out of it. The thing that pulled him out, in his case, was Destiny's debate with JonTron, where Destiny ended Nazism once and for all, or something like that. I didn't, I don't know, I didn't watch it. He concludes this 48-minute video with what he sees as the most important aspect of online politics as he moves forward on his journey into leftism. There's one thing above all of this that may be the most important thing, and that's optics. I know I'm not just speaking for myself when I say that the stereotype of an SJW is off-putting to most people. Don't let yourself fit into the mold of the straw man that reactionaries have made of us. If we defy their expectations and their stereotypes, they won't know how to counter us. Us leftists, we have facts, statistics, data, and even historical context on our side. If people like us can drown out the loud minority that the right uses to make their hit pieces, they won't have any more material. First of all, what did this person do to you? They look fine. They look good. I want a portable ball sack. Where do you even get that? I love this though. He's like, yeah, you can be a leftist as long as you're not one of those filthy fucking degenerate SJWs because they make us look very bad. I know this because right wingers told me so, but let's cut him some slack. That was two years ago. He's probably grown up and become a big boy now. Let's see what he's up to. One of the biggest common talking points from the right during this era was the left was too afraid to debate and defend their positions. Nobody on the left wanted to debate. The left at the time were high and mighty, BuzzFeed videos, feminist like video essay content, woke scoldy, high and mighty, preachy, non-funny, non-edgy, milk toast, uh, fucking white wa- not whitewashed, fucking sugar, uh, sugar sweet, fucking condescending left-wing content made by, well, trans people with with pink hair okay and blue hair which obviously isn't a problem in and of itself but it does kind of make the left you know it makes right wing gives white right wingers makes them mad oh i feel i feel like i've heard this somewhere before hmm. this hyper fixation on optics is indicative of a framework of political thought that views the world through a lens of what the right will think of us and little more and that's what i take issue with basing your politics on practicality is a good thing but when the crux of your argument rests upon dictating the terms of how other people should look and act and uh silencing minorities no no he said drowning out the loud minority drown out the loud minority sure okay my bad just save that one in the memory bank for later silencing minorities drowning out the loud minority okay dude when optics is the crux of the argument this to me is in some ways indistinguishable from just being an anti-sjw person yourself because it means that your online content overton window always has to include the gamer gator perspective and how much leftism can you really be getting done if that's the case all of this this makes a lot more sense when we look at where Xanderhal is getting this whole narrative from. In his video, he starts off by citing another YouTuber, whose video's thesis forms the basis of his own. And the channel he cites just so happens to be an actual reactionary YouTuber, whose primary content focus is dunking on e-girls and, uh defending leafy oh my god so uh what's going on there this all reminds me of last year when he wouldn't stop saying ableist slurs despite his community's objections to him doing so his reasoning was that gamer language such as this is more effective at bringing people over from the right it only took about 12 debates and seven response videos for him to eventually stop hyperbole strike seven he did stop and that's good but not without it requiring severe pushback from multiple different creators xanderhal does go on to say that optics aren't everything and that it's okay to be trans or something trans people with with pink hair but i'm more so talking about the attitude not like the 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 optics of who's advocating for what right that doesn't matter i don't believe in the idea that like we should relegate certain identities to the to the sidelines because their identities are like uh bad optics i don't believe in that okay optics are important but they're not everything right <laughs> But that was only after the Gamergate tirade spilling out of him. Condescending, scolding, trans people with pink hair. So it's stuff like this that makes me wonder about the boundaries of what these communities are able to accomplish. And whether or not the high regard debate lords seem to hold themselves in is warranted. But you can decide that for yourself. See the current state of the valiant white debate lord saviors of the American online left. Stop it. He'll probably complain about being clipped out of context, but I mean, the full video's there. It's it's a full video you you can watch the whole thing also if you do go there don't say anything mean please just comment squid gang with six g's but that's all i really needed to say about that guy so yeah on to the important stuff now title card right now thanks <laughs> 
so now we've dealt with that sort of silly stuff, uh, I want to move on to a more serious example of where I feel that these spaces are causing harm within the online left. I think it actually makes the most sense to start this story by briefly going back to Xander Hall reacting to something that I tweeted. I know, I'm making you watch me watch someone react to my tweets. It's disgraceful, but I promise I'm going somewhere with this. And then this is the one, this is the one that instantly, if anyone says Vosh is wrong in the Professor Flowers debate, there's just no saving them, okay? There's no saving them. They're a piece of shit, okay? Because they're defending genocide. There's just, that. that is the, the dichotomy in that debate. You're either anti-genocide or pro-woke genocide. You're, you're either pro-genocide or anti-genocide. And certain people on the left are pro-genocide because it looks woke in a certain way. Okay, so if you have no idea what any of that meant, let me get you up to speed. The tweet he is referencing is talking about a conflict from a couple of months ago that happened between the large left-leaning streamer Vosh and the small leftist video essayist Professor Flowers. My tweet is saying that Vosh was in the wrong in that conflict. This interaction began when Professor Flowers made a video critiquing Vosh for conflating black nationalism with white nationalism in a prior debate. Vosh reacted to this video on his stream. He disagreed with her characterizations of him. Professor Flowers made a video responding to his disagreements. He reacted to that video on his stream and disagreed. He then invited her on the stream to discuss, which ended up turning into a debate. After this, she released one final video on it, and so did he. That's not where this ends, but for now, that summary should suffice. The debate was, well, a shit show, as both parties have since acknowledged, and as we'll get into in a moment. But the effects that it had on the online left content space were much more serious and malicious. One of these effects, as Xander Hall has so succinctly put it in his video, is that it's treated as orthodox thought in debate spaces that anyone who agrees with or defends Professor Flowers in any capacity is pro-genocide or sympathetic to violent ethnostates. That is the dichotomy in that debate. You're either anti-genocide or pro-woke genocide. Now, this idea comes from somewhere. It comes straight from the source, actually. From the overlord of the debate realm himself, Vosh. Since this debate nearly six months ago, Vosh has continued to characterize Professor Flowers as being an anti-white racist, whose ideology inevitably leads to genocide. Here he is talking about it last week on his stream. It's like Professor Flowers. I think that Professor Flowers is basically just an anti-white racist who stumbled into a misunderstanding of decolonial uh, terminology. There are always bad people who will mask their ideology through sort of euphemism and adjacent positions. How many super far-right fasci types cloak their positions in the front of, like, nationalism? Not, like, hyper-nationalist, fascist, whatever, you know, but just, like, regular American nationalism. That's, like, the most common thing in the book, you know? It's not even, like, anything PF said was that extreme either. It's ethnic cleansing. I don't get it. There's enough lore and content regarding this interaction to last anyone who's interested until next winter, so I'm just gonna give my honest opinion and summarize it in the following way. I do not think that anyone that has actually listened to Professor Flower's videos on this topic can make any of the claims that Vosh and his fans continue to make about her, calling her an anti-white racist that is pro-genocide or pro-ethnostates is a lie, as it was never the content of her arguments. It was a narrative crafted by the failings of the format of online debate streaming. More on that later. We'll come back to this later. But more importantly, thanks to the means by which this narrative was conceived, with Vosh arguing against decolonization and separatism using fear of retribution rhetoric, it's all well and good to talk about living free of your oppressors, but when you break apartheid in South Africa, there are millions of white people living in that country. Like, what do you do? Do you just, like, ship them all? out? Do you build camps? I mean, there's not really any way to do that without genocide, you know? It has created a hostile space for black creators wanting to discuss issues like black separatism and black nationalism, and this in turn serves to reinforce the racial status quo of left tube, which is something that, especially as leftists, we should not be wanting to reinforce. In his retrospective video on the conflict, Vosh still fails to meaningfully recognize the distinction between black separatism and white nationalism, which was the main criticism of Professor Flower's original video. Black separatism is essentially essentially just the black version of white nationalism. It's just kind of couched in this, like, a different type of victim rhetoric. The end result tends to lead to ethno, uh, sorry, uh, ethnic supremacy and ethnostates, and I think that's bad no matter what. Mind you, this is after like half a year of this being explained to him in varying degrees of simplicity, that this comparison between these two different things serves to ignore the historical context of these movements, and comparing it to Nazism is, um, ignorant, to put it lightly. Gary, anything you want to say here, or can I just keep going? Um, okay, well, I guess on the debate side, we did find Professor Flowers guilty of a few crimes. Okay. First off, racial essentialization. 
What the f*** is that? It's when you call white people colonizers. It's racist dog whistling. Oh, Jesus f***ing Christ. This should be disqualifying from the entire left. The idea that literally just admitting by colonizer I'm using it as a dog whistle for white. Okay, give me the timestamp where she said it was okay to call white people colonizers. What? Um... You don't have it, do you? Not on hand. Okay, well, no one does because it doesn't exist. But she said white people are colonizers. How is this not an endorsement of- Who colonized the world, Gary? Europeans. Okay, and what did Europeans look like? Like you. So, white, right? Yeah, but that doesn't mean it's okay to call white people colonizers. That's racist, hurts our movement, and pushes away potential new leftists. Gary, I already explained this. That's not what Professor Flowers was saying. Her point was that colonization is an ongoing process, and choosing to ignore this fact makes it impossible for us to truly reconcile with its legacy. Anyone with a baseline understanding of these issues that saw the debate understood that this was the perspective she was coming from, and that Vosh trying to frame this as somehow being racist against white people was, to use an amongous term, sus. Why is the, the context of oppression irrelevant? Why is the context of who has power irrelevant? Because, and this is, and I'll say it once more, and this is why you should really check your racism, my friend. White people and colonizers aren't the same group. The people who are white in South Africa are regular humans who live their lives. They are not physical. Colonization Wait, is still they are happening. Not physical like, America. They are, yes, it's the concept of colonization is happening. You do not then get to attack six million ethnic minorities in a country. That's what you're doing. You're taking a sociological problem and making it a race problem, which is, by the way, what conservatives do to black people. <laughs> In this debate, Bosch employed the argument of the fear of retribution because, as members of the gamer zone tend to do, he was testing the limits of her moral framework using an extreme hypothetical, which is a very normal thing to do. It's one of the most normal things you can do, actually. So you're saying that hypotheticals have no value. What, are you too stupid to understand how they work? The ability to imagine made-up scenarios and argue about them is what distinguishes sentient life from animals. Shut up, dude. No, I don't have a problem with hypotheticals as a concept. I do however, have a problem with people being framed as endorsing the extreme outcomes of these hypotheticals. It's not even like anything PF said was that extreme either. It's ethnic cleansing. When they never would have argued for them in the first place had they not been brought to the table by Vosh or whichever debate lord they are encountering. In multiple conversations since, Vosh has attributed this escalation in rhetoric to Professor Flowers, escalations like equating land back to genocide. Here he is talking with indigenous activist Morgan Khashoggi about land back. Morgan and Vosh are referencing Professor Flowers in this clip. It feels like a very virtue signally thing sometimes to be very mm -hmm. yeah. in favor of decolonization. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, pro land back. But then when it actually comes to talking about these issues and actually like mm -hmm. reconciling, like sometimes it can get, I think, a little bit, um, well, there's, there's a, cl a clear dissonance. So it's not that people are getting it so wrong. It's just we need to smooth some wrinkles out so that people don't start using really inflammatory language to describe how we feel about our own problems. The weird part is that Professor Flowers never spoke on these issues on the terms of genocide until she spoke with Vosh, which should be of no surprise to anyone familiar with debate bros. Over the course of all these interactions, the first time the word genocide is ever used is here at 4 minutes and 45 seconds into their debate, and it's not mentioned by Professor Flowers. When you take a look at a lot of black separatist communities, there are a lot of underlying reactionary tendencies like homophobia, anti semitism it seems like the fundamental bones are pretty similar and then when you get into the logistics of creating an ethno state there's not really any way to do that without genocide you know like take south africa right i mean it's all well and good to talk about living free of your oppressors but when you break apartheid in south africa there are millions of white people living in that country like what do you do do you just like ship them all out do you build camps i mean it seems like this logic always leads down a really bad road. Isolate that last quote. It seems like this logic always leads down a really bad road. That conception right there, that limit testing ideology, is precisely what causes the inflammatory language to start being used in these conversations. The same language that the actual land-backed activist said was causing so many problems. Using really inflammatory language to describe how we feel about our own problems. There's not really any way to do that without genocide, you know? Discussing ideas in this 
this manner by pulling them to the extremes in a combative context is especially damaging with topics like black separatism, a topic that the white online left has repeatedly demonstrating having very little knowledge about, and thanks to Vosh and others, very little willingness to inquire further. Vosh just says they're Nazis in reverse, and everyone's like, okay, cool. Black separatism is essentially just the black version of white nationalism. All of this has been explained ad nauseum in these videos, but the YouTuber Carr, he has a great channel by the way, go check him out, he explains why this is ignorant as clearly as I've seen anyone do in this clip from Professor Flower's last video. Let's see if people will get it this time. 147th time's the charm. I'd like to set the record straight on black separatism because a lot of people seem to get it wrong in online spaces. The best way, I think, to visualize it for anyone listening, separatism is basically self-determination and creating as much space away from your oppressors as possible, allowing you to act upon that self-determination. If that creating space from oppressors requires violence, then it requires violence. It doesn't have to, though. You can talk about Rosewood, Tulsa. You can talk about MOVE in Philadelphia. MOVE was a black separatist movement, and the cops bombed it, and they killed eight children, and they burnt down a block of townhomes. So this organization did not was not responsible for anyone being hurt in their town whatsoever. They literally just wanted to do what they saw, mind you, white people doing throughout the country, building compounds and building their own internal insular support networks and dual power structures. That's ultimately what separatism is about, is creating that space between the oppressors and the oppressed or plundered people so that they can act upon that self-determination. It's never been about ethnic cleansing. It's been about creating a safe distance. It's ethnic cleansing. I don't get it. We saw the same problem with hypotheticals arise in Vosh's recent debate with YouTuber Noncompete, where he opposed this hypothetical regarding Jews being overrepresented in banking during the Weimar Republic. Whenever people have been enslaved, if they rise up and use violence to liberate themselves, then that is probably acceptable because they had material conditions in which they- Like so the Nazis? Rising up against the Nazis was acceptable, yes. No, no, no. The... After World War I, the Nazis claimed that Jewish bankers were holding the country down. Through and that was false consciousness because that wasn't actually happening. How can you tell? That was false consciousness. Their, their ideology was not aligned with reality. How, how can you tell? Because Jews don't actually control banks in the world. There was a disproportionate number of Jewish control of banks in Germany during the Weimar Republic. All right, Vosh, we're done here. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> this is, uh, that's all I need to hear. You don't have an ethical... Oh my god. I'd run too if I was him. In case anyone's curious about what's happening there, that guy was actually too stupid to have a conversation with. Oh Jesus Christ, why did I ever watch this stuff? In response to non-competes claim that no, the Jews did not control the banks. Jews don't actually control banks in the world. Vosh responds with, actually, yes they did. There was a disproportionate number of Jewish control of banks in Germany during the Weimar Republic. All right, Vosh, we're done here. He doubles down on this claim in a follow-up video days later by arguing that this is a statistic accurate reading of history. The critical thing here is that for me saying that there was a, a disproportionate amount of Jewish control of the banks in the Weimar Republic, a bunch of people online are calling me a Nazi. We're like everywhere, it's like a whole meme thing. And the weird thing is, as I understood when going into the debate and then have such looked into and have found that yes, this is the case, there was. The reason non-compete hung up here wasn't because his ethical system had been exposed or whatever these guys are always talking about. You don't have an ethical- oh my god. But because, even engaging with this claim that Jews controlled the banks at any level of historical specificity, seeds the entire argument to the fascists. Whether they did or not should be irrelevant. The real question is, why would this matter? I'm dropping a quick tactical Zizek nuke here because it's relevant regarding the topic of debates with racists and fascists. Why is this false? Because the Nazis here, even if it were to be true, but it wasn't, of course, they lied in the guise of truth. Because the true question is not, is it true what they are claiming about the Jews? The true question is why, in order to sustain their, their politics, they need this fantasy of the Jew. Why they need this phantasmatic figure of the Jew? And incidentally, it's the same, I think, even today with Iraq. Here I got, here I think that many fake leftists fell into the trap of accepting the terms of the debate. The true question is not, is it true what, what they claim about Saddam? The true question is a totally different one, is what kind of new logic of hegemony, new world order is established in this way and so on and so on. Even to accept these terms and then to argue, you put yourself into a totally idiotic position, you know. When there you have to argue, oh, but it's not so bad, some people nonetheless supported Saddam. That's not our debate. 
by God. No, I don't think Vosh is an anti-Semite, but I wouldn't be terribly upset at anyone who got this impression after seeing Vosh uncritically repeat this false Nazi talking point and then double down on it, or if they'd encountered the legions of Vosh fans spending hours online after the debate, arguing that yes, actually the Jews did control the banks before the Holocaust because my favorite streamer said so. It's these sorts of nonsense magic fairy tale wonderland hypotheticals that have no use outside of the performative debate context that end up leaving a lasting impression on the internet. These little Vosh freaks flocked to non-compete to call him technically pro-Nazi when their streamer was the one spreading Nazi misinformation. Part of my issue with debate streams is that misinformation like this is so easy to spread yet so difficult to correct. It's why this video has to be two f***ing hours long and take weeks of work to make. They stream for eight hours a day and say shit like this, completely ignoring the real world complexities of these issues and reducing them to fun little rhetorical games to be used for dunking on other YouTubers. That guy was actually too stupid to have a conversation with. Then all their fans start spreading this shit around the internet uncritically and wonder why people call them Nazis. A bunch of people online are calling me a Nazi. There was a disproportionate number of Jewish control of banks in Germany during the Weimar Republic. This is really weird to me. I've seen an accusation thrown around the internet that Vosh is a Pedialyte drinker because of a number of older clips from his stream where he brings up things like chimichangas, and Pedialyte, not unlike the examples we just looked at. Now, Gary, I need you, man. Hey, hey, hey. So straight up, these clips are weird as fuck. So fucking weird. Weird and wrong as arguments. I'm not gonna play them because I am hanging on to a single shred of hope that this video will still be able to get monetized. It probably won't though. But uh, Gary? Well, despite Noah's objections to these clips and their apparent sussiness, there isn't anything in them that would merit the claim that Vosh is a Pedialyte drinker. That is a very serious accusation to be making and to make it without solid proof is dangerous and we should not normalize doing that. Thanks, man. Okay. So at some point in time, Vosh stopped using these extreme examples involving children in hypotheticals, probably because using them only encouraged people to make these spurious, but not out of nowhere accusations against him. So if he understands that handling these sensitive topics carelessly can have negative consequences and has adjusted his behavior accordingly in the past when they've affected him, why can't he do the same for others? As we've seen, the effects are real. Professor Flowers is the target of a harassment campaign spurred on by Vosh with his use of this hypothetical about the fear of retribution. Noncompete was accused of technically defending Nazism because Vosh, through his little rhetorical game, justified this treatment in their eyes. He is either choosing to ignore these facts or just doesn't care, and both of these should be unacceptable, right? There's a great thread from a streamer called Ask Vera that runs through the standard procedure of interactions with debate streamers and how they are a recurring problem. Number four is especially relevant here. Reactionary debaters smuggle assumptions into hypotheticals, hoping you get distracted with the hypothetical rather than challenge the assumption. This is precisely what happened to Professor Flowers regarding the topic of genocide, and this distraction has forced her onto her back foot ever since. Here she is talking about it in her final video on the topic. So there are a lot of people who are saying that I'm genocidal, and I just want to clear up what I mean. What I mean to say is that there is no amount of violence that colonized people can enact towards their colonizers that will ever compare to what colonizers have done to them. That compares to the millions of kidnapped and enslaved people, to the thousands of years of history and way of life that has been wiped out, to the languages that have been lost, to the entire caste system that has been created, to the relocation and murder of millions, to the subjugation of entire nations, and to the subjugation and profit of stolen land. She is right. Do I need to explain that further? Hopefully not, because I'm not gonna. It's not my job to educate you. But I want you to watch how Vosh reacts to this clip on his stream. There is no amount of violence that colonized people can enact towards their colonizers that will ever compare to what colonizers have done to them. That compares to- What does that mean? What is- First of all, that's not what she meant, because that's a totally different concept. Is that even, like, relevant? What does that have to do with what we're talking about? History and way of life that has been wiped out, to the languages that have been lost, to the- Also, doesn't this kind of support my argument? This seems very strange to me, because it feels like the implicit suggestion is that the violence that colonized people do is okay, because it could never- it could never be enough. You know what I mean? So Professor Flowers says these things cannot be compared and attempting to do so downplays this very real history of oppression. Again, an objectively true statement. And to this, Vosh responds, you claim to not want to do white genocide, yet you cite historical oppression, which could be used to justify white genocide. Huh, curious. Very curious indeed, checkmate, Nazi. So 
This is racist, right? Am I allowed to say that yet? I think what you mean to say is that while this individual act may not be racist, the way this flow of information has been set up has led to a racist outcome. That outcome being Professor Flowers discussing historical oppressions here is seen as a potential justification for retributive violence, which was never her point and not how these claims should be viewed, especially from anyone claiming to be on the left. Yeah, so it's racist. Okay. Thanks to their debate, which in effect served to legitimize this fear of retribution rhetoric, a white supremacist narrative is being repeated all over the place, making it so that topics requiring nuanced discussion, like black separatism and black nationalism, are framed as being not only inherently violent, but equivalent to Nazism. If we take a quick peek at some of the chats from that stream, it's quite interesting. Mom said it's time for me to be the colonizer. It's a pro-genocide argument, basically saying that the image of white people in chains while MLK smiles in the sky is based. That is her saying that a white genocide is justified. So that means reverse genocide, good. Leftism, it's good. Leftism, we love it. Thousands of years of history and way of life that has been wiped out. To the languages that have been lost, to the entire caste system that has been created. Our resident critical race theory scholar, Xander Hall, elaborates here. I'm gonna say this right now. I'm gonna call it out. When people say woke genocide to refer to like the, the black separatist stuff, it's kind of racist. I'm gonna be honest here because it's not woke. All you're doing is putting woke before something that has to do with brown people because it has to do with brown people. It's not woke. There's nothing about what Professor Flowers or, or Black Hammer or any of these people advocate for that is woke. Being woke is advocating for integration and cooperation, okay? A multicultural, multi-ethnic, multiracial movement to fight against the systems of oppression in this country that put certain groups of people down, right? That is woke. Segregation, even if it's, well, we, we're black people and we want segregation. That is not woke. Just because brown people are doing it doesn't make it woke. Oh, that's just great stuff. We love it. Leftism is when reverse racism is the scariest thing you can think of. Mom, can you pick me up, please? They're not being colorblind. There's a good clip from the YouTuber Bad Empanada that explains how ridiculous it is to try to make this comparison. Let's imagine a different world where white people did all the same thing and the black people were more radical and they were like, you know, we, we want you guys to get the f out of here. You know, we're, we're not just going to forgive you for centuries and centuries of oppression, for enforcing apartheid upon us for a hundred years. We want you gone. Would that be the same thing as Nazism? No, not even fucking close, man. Truly unbelievable. And w do I think that would be an ideal solution? Also, no. Is that what I would want? Also, no. Can I understand it? Absolutely, yes. Did you really just cite bad empanada in your video? Looks like you've lost me. That guy is a bad person. Everybody knows that. Me citing a clip of bad empanada Banata saying something that's objectively true is not an endorsement of everything that he has done on the internet. Please stop being a fucking baby. Just look at the meme, okay? Look at the meme. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's really helpful for me, actually. I'm slowly swinging around your baby's crib so you can gently fall asleep. Okay, thank you. Now, from my perspective, Vosh seems to be defensive about these ideas because he is operating on some underlying assumptions about who Professor Flowers is, assumptions that were created when they had their debate. There's an extremely relevant video that I'd like to plug here, Debate Me, How to Know Things on YouTube, from Scottish Neoliberalism Understander, John the Duncan. Please go watch this, especially if you watch Vosh. Sorry, John, just have to send them your way, but uh, the debate bro deprogramming industrial complex has to start somewhere, and your two videos will be our foundational texts. But this one addresses many core issues of online debate culture, one of them being how knowledge is created in these spaces, and how this knowledge, gathered through the act of debate, is often held supreme above all other forms, and how this is maybe not the best thing for the left. I think the issue with this proliferation of debate is that it further embedded the idea that debate is a legitimate way of finding out whether something is correct and true. This is another example of YouTube's structures influencing how knowledge is produced. The platform encourages certain types of content which then impacts how both viewers and other content creators view knowledge creation. And this might not be an issue if debate related at all to any sort of truth. The problem is, it doesn't. So Vosh's defensiveness, or inability to sort of stop being a silly guy is a byproduct of this overvaluing of what debate actually is. From Vosh's perspective, Professor Flowers is who she showed herself to be in that debate, and this, above all other things, is the information upon which we should base all of our subsequent attitudes and treatment towards her. Well, to be fair, Noah, he is a debate streamer. That's his medium. That is how he gathers his information, by talking to people. How else is he supposed to know what they're all about? Um, that's kind of the issue, Gary. The hypothetical 
logical answer to this question is that he can actually watch their videos. He can listen to what they're saying when they've put a lot of effort into researching and presenting their arguments. But this form of listening is antithetical to his content format. In order to retain his position as standing rhetorical genius supreme. Noah, bad faith, bad faith. Okay. In order to keep his stream moving and entertaining, he often skips around looking for arguments that he can try to respond to in these videos or pauses before the points have been fully argued. He actually did the former with FD signifiers break bread, which is disappointing because there was a lot of particularly relevant information in that video. The scary reality is that the very homogenous nature of their fan bases Where's my who face? are fresh out of radical hate filled movements. And for now, they're- I Yeah, I don't, nah, nah, I don't. Yeah, I'm not. Again, like this is too generous, but the idea that anyone who does debates are like, oh, it's just sophistry and like, they're not as smart as the video essayists and they're just like, you know, they just do rhetoric, but they don't really have any real, like this, like, yeah, no, I don't know. He acknowledges later in that clip that he isn't giving the video a fair shot and says to go watch it, which is good. I'm jumping in on this bit at the end, interpreting every statement as though it applies to me and responding defensively to it. So this is not like a fair representation of the video as a whole. I'd encourage you all to look at the whole video yourselves. But still, this format presents a clear dilemma to our ability to exchange information. This is documented in Professor Flower's videos, where she shows the way Vosh doesn't ever actually engage with her arguments in an honest manner. Now, for the rest of the stream, Vosh skips over the segment where I talk about nationalism in the context of colonized people and enslaved people versus white nationalism. He also skips the part where I talk about black separatism, black supremacy, and even racism. It's an important part to skip, and unfortunately, Vosh doesn't realize that this addresses many of his accusations. Again, those are all linked below. More homework to get through before the next time I post, which at this rate will probably be in like July. So you got plenty of time. Don't procrastinate. Make sure you turn in your FAFSA as well. Don't want to miss out on that big old bag of cash. So if we are choosing to ignore all of that and just rely on debate streams for our information, you can probably see the problem this creates, right? No matter how many times Professor Flowers says that genocide is not and was never something that she nor any land back or decolonization activists were talking about. Out. In Vosh and his audience's mind, she will always be the person in this clip. What do you think of the six million white people who live in that country? Do you think the black people, who are by far the majority, have a right to remove the white population? I think that they would have a right to do that, but I think that would be really harsh, and I think that, that they're not even going to do that. Out of curiosity, do you know how many Jews died in the Holocaust? It's so funny to watch these gotcha moments happen when he gets people caught in these little traps. You can see the excitement on his face. It's like when the shark from Nemo first smells blood. I think that they would have a right to do that, but I think that would be really harsh, and I think that, that they're not even going to do that. Hey, do you know how many Jews died in the Holocaust? So to them, she will always be the person that stumbled over the oh-so-simple question of genocide. You're gonna say, but? Really? You're gonna say the B word after I just said the G word? Oh, so you wanna kill white people then? Okay, I can't believe this. This is so messed up. I'm literally being murdered right now. The problem with these exchanges lacking any sort of nuance was explained perfectly here by the indigenous activist Morgan Khashoggi in her conversation with Vosh. In this clip, she is referencing one of the follow-up conversations turned debates that Professor Flowers had with another streamer. One of the ways that I saw that was when Dr. Heemdout had said, well, you know, I'm an immigrant and I believe that everybody has a right to live where they live, which is a, an idea that I agree with. So he says, well, why can't I just live where I live? And uh, Professor Flowers says, well, because you're living on stolen land and that land is, is still stolen. And that's also true. Both of these opinions are valid opinions to have, but neither of them fully encapsulate the nuance of what it is to be an indigenous person repping the land back movement. Okay, fantastic. Great point, Morgan. Pitting two perspectives against one another in order to find a victor is probably bad. If we want to learn anything about these multifaceted issues, I wonder why people are doing that. You do not then get to attack six million ethnic minorities in a country. That's what you're doing. <laughs> Me, when someone tells me that my entire online presence creates an irredeemable intellectual vacuum. 
Okay, fantastic. Hassan had some relevant words on the shortcomings of knowledge acquired through debate. My main goal isn't to fucking thrive on being the big brained intellectual titan, because when you do that, that just means they are still responding simply to power. You're not actually creating or crafting an argument or showing people a different worldview. You're just simply the big bad uh, gladiator, the intellectual gladiator. And as long as you continue being that guy, they will fucking give you money and give you praise because they think you're the smartest guy in the room, because that's the only way they can understand who is smart or not. I apologize for most of this video being me playing clips of other people making my points for me, but I'm um, not gonna lie. I'm not that smart. Noah Samson's a fucking idiot. I'm good at making YouTube videos and talking about other YouTubers, but that's about it. Please don't copyright claim me. You're being paid in exposure. You're welcome, Hassan. But this is what people mean when they talk about how debate streams are all about winning and domination. Vosh beat Professor Flowers in this debate. He won. He proved to the cheering Coliseum crowd that she is the bad, dumb lady, and he is the good, smart guy. That's how it will exist in his mind and the minds of his audience of hundreds of thousands of people until, well, forever, it seems like. Far smarter people than me have tried to explain why this shit is ridiculous and reinforces white supremacy online, but none have prevailed. The debate zone might just be an impenetrable bubble of stupidity. Hey. Okay, that one was a bit harsh. Thank you. The debate zone is definitely not an impenetrable bubble of stupidity. Is that sarcasm? Nope. All right, carry on. I've seen that Vosh is capable of having fruitful conversations with other leftists in the past. One great example is his talk with YouTuber and anarchist history PhD haver Zoe Baker in late 2020. Despite their ideological differences, they shared both of their perspectives on political strategy in a non-combative manner and were able to move forward with a better understanding of each other's views. But when it comes to talking with other leftists about issues he lacks perspective on, it mostly goes like this. What an asshole. Or like this. Are you listening to a yeah. word that I'm saying? Or this. That guy was actually too stupid to have a conversation with. Or this. I'm starting to wonder if you're educated enough to have this conversation. In before you say I'm clip chimping, cope and seethe, liberals. No, I'm just kidding. I, I don't say shit like that in real life. All of those full conversations are linked below. Go watch them and see if you can identify where and why they went wrong. Hint, 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 hint. Here is a clip of Vosh talking about how he views these types of conversations that I think is very telling. I'm gonna put it this way, okay? I've talked to a decent number of lefty video essayists who disagree with me, and not one of them has come out looking good. <laughs> you guys understand that, right? Like, the the times we've talked with, with the video essayists, when they come to disagree, like, this this is not like, uh, like, I'm, I'm, I'm blinded by their intellect when they come over here. This is very, like, a very aesthetic obsession, the idea that, like, oh, video essayists are smart because they have scripts. Once again, he is implicitly reinforcing the idea that the gamer's marketplace of ideas is some supreme form of knowledge creation and anyone who can't hang with his rhetoric must be too stupid to have a conversation with. He follows that up by saying this. Well, you know what? What I do isn't easy. I don't have a script and I never think about anything that I do. It's all just off the cuff, okay? I don't have any brain at all. This is just reflex. I'm not even thinking about what I say. Okay, so he's joking here, and I really do appreciate Vosh's sense of humor. But where's the lie, though? Like, I'm not saying he has no brain. I'm saying it would be awesome if he took this I'm just a dumb streamer, no thoughts, head empty approach and actually operated as if he understood that. So, in a word, humility. But it's so strange how he can acknowledge this here in a joke. I don't have any brain at all. While simultaneously citing his rhetoric as being the peak of online intellectualism. Not one of them has come out looking good. <laughs> Being open to where your gaps in knowledge are makes things better for everyone involved in interactions. But most of the time, he does the exact opposite of that, and it can be hard to watch. I'm starting to wonder if you're educated enough to have this conversation. And so, because of all of this, Professor Flowers now exists as a character in the debate bro canon. The crazy black separatist lady that hates white people and loves genocide, and any and all subsequent harassment and content made at her expense is therefore totally justified under the pretense that, well, we saw her true colors in that debate, so so she deserves it. Bad, 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 very bad, very bad, bad. Whenever Vosh hears people describe what he does as enabling harassment, he responds with this. You know, there's a whole uh, narrative about my community harassing people, but in spite of nearly three years of trying to track down the people actually doing this, I've yet to be provided a single piece of evidence of it actually happening. Usually the initial claim is some very severe, you know, uh, Vosh community, you know, harassing, like really bad stuff, right? But then I get some screenshots and it's usually people just being kind of mean, which I'm fine with. I don't have a problem with people being mean to people I don't like. Okay, um... 
if you deliberately mischaracterize someone as being in favor of ethno states and genocide it's ethnic cleansing to your massive audience how on earth does this not enable harassment like he's convinced hundreds of thousands of people that literal hitler is on twitter and you can tweet at them and not only that but you should because you know he's fine with his fans being mean to people he doesn't like it's as if he's deliberately trying to miss the point of why what he does is a problem the response here is especially bizarre if we watch how non-compete brought this issue to his attention right before that last clip of Vosh's denial. What I've noticed, and a lot of people have noticed, is a pattern where whenever you talk about somebody who is, shall we say, marginalized, you know, black or trans or person of color, that there's a tendency for those people to um, receive a lot of kind of like after effect collateral damage in terms of harassment, threats, uh, and, and other kinds of like, you know, disturbing attacks like that. Now, I've seen it happen with Luna because I'm married to her. We spend all of our time together. I monitor, I, I help her uh, administrate her comments and that sort of thing. And I also know other people who have shown me similar results, you know. So I just, I guess my first question is, are you aware of that or, or would you deny that that's something that happens? I think I'd mostly deny it. Non-compete is being pretty reasonable here, right? Just trying to draw attention to a problem that he's seen firsthand that's actively harming marginalized people. That's directly correlated with Vosh's actions. And Vosh is just like, nope, nope, not me, not my problem. None of this is my responsibility. Am I overstepping by saying that this is bad? Bad, 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 very bad, very bad, bad. Related to the issue of the nature of harassment from these spaces is their crusade against identity politics. On multiple occasions, the first thing that comes to Vosh's mind as a potential motivation for people wanting to defend Professor Flowers is that they are doing so because she's black or caving to identity politics. There are a bunch of directions you can go in this. I do think a lot of people on the left are just castrated whiteies or whatever who just refuse to disagree with women of color i can only see this same pattern so many times where like some woman comes out with some insane shit and people defend them or whatever this is what xander hall references when he calls supporting professor flowers wanting to look woke we're black people and we want segregation that is not woke amazing stuff that we're dealing with here it's just really strange to me that this is the first and seemingly only reason that they could think of as to why people would want to side with her and not that maybe in her videos she made good points that were well researched and provided more information on these topics than anything that could have ever come from that nightmare of a debate. Points that, had they actually listened to, would have answered all of their stupid fucking questions. Hey now. Perfectly valid inquiries. Okay. But I guess actually listening to her would mean no more content for them, so never mind. Hey. I mean, their content is heavily reliant on drama and miscommunications can feed into drama. So listening and understanding are both actively discouraged in this online debate space. And that's something which we should try to change. Better. By putting all debate streamers in prison. God damn it. That's satire, by the way. Um, abolish the prison industrial complex. Except keep it open for debate streamers only. Oh my god. Like, okay, sure. I could see some people jumping to the conclusion that Vosh was in the wrong without really engaging with the content of the debate. They click on the video, see this shouty white devil's advocate style individual and a black lady, and click off to write a mean tweet about how Vosh bad. That probably does happen. I'm sure sometimes even because of internalized racism or whatever. But that explanation can only go so far. Again, I'm thinking using debate bro brain here. But in the same way that Vosh is waiting on proof of his fans' harassment, I have yet to see substantial evidence that the people siding with Professor Flowers are doing so just because she's black. If it's there, someone please show it to me. Quantify your claims. That's your guys' whole thing, right? Until that happens, though, it seems like a huge leap in logic to be making, especially given the content of her responses. And it strikes strikes me as, at least ostensibly, quite racist. Especially when, thanks to Vosh, this whole anti-identity politics crusade is being waged by leftists all across the internet, in places where it has no right to be. For example, on January 9th I tweeted this screenshot of one of Vosh's YouTube videos where he reviews an introductory lesson on dialectical materialism from Vietnamese communist YouTuber Luna Oi. His video is titled, This is the stupidest tanky video I have ever seen, brain damage suffered. The point of my tweet was to say that this title was unnecessarily inflammatory, especially given the content of the video, which is a point that I stand by. But take a moment to look at this reply to my tweet. Is there an actual problem here, or are we just gallantly coming to the rescue of the helpless and vulnerable female POC? Like, yep. 
you got it. That's the only reason. It couldn't possibly be because he called a benign theory video brain damage inducing. You are so smart. I must be one of those uh, circumcised whites or whatever Vosh called them. Castrated whiteies. Here's another exchange from this week. A Vosh fan tweets, Professor Flowers advocated for allowing genocide on colonizers. Someone replies, no, she didn't because she didn't. This person then responds with, anytime any person of color says anything remotely disagreeable, we're supposed to shut up. Nope, nope, no one is saying that. <laughs> Literally no one is saying that. You are just saying that out of nowhere and it feels kind of racist, man, not gonna lie. In these people's minds, whenever someone defends a person of color that disagrees with Bosch, they're obviously only doing it because they want to look woke or score points with those Twitter tankies or doing self-loathing crimes or whatever. Because why else would they disagree with Bosch? The possibility that he can be wrong doesn't seem to cross their minds. You can see this response in his chat anytime anyone mentions that someone is of racialized or marginalized status. Status. In pull, in pull, in pull, in pull, in pull. Vosh and his orbiters have made it a part of the brand to value argument over identity. And while that concept on its face isn't a bad thing, it has clearly grown into a problem where the automatic tendency of his viewers is to write off the perspectives of marginalized communities, not in spite of their race, but because of it. So my call to action in this section is please deprogram whatever it is in your brain that makes you say shit like this before even reading what anyone is saying. Thanks. Also, stop watching debate streams. Okay, thanks. Bye. So, I've said most of what I feel like I've needed to say, but I want to take a moment to look at something I found that was interesting to me at the end of Vosh's stream segment. In this clip, Vosh is frustrated by the online left's apparent failings in who they choose to support. It's a long clip, so that's... it's just a long clip. That's... it's just a long clip. That's just a long clip. The thing that really weirds me out, and like, I hope, I hope this doesn't get misinterpreted, but like, I follow a lot of small lefty YouTubers and streamers. Like, I try to pay attention to like smaller communities so that I don't get too in my head. And there are so many awesome, like, POC creators who get like no attention, you know? And then it feels like the ones that the online left always jumps to, to support are the worst ones, you know? It's really weird. Like I very rarely see like these big like like jumps to to the to the support of like the really cool the cool ones. Not even people in my orbit or whatever, just generally cool creators. Like how many times has this happened? Uh Mel, Luna, Professor Flowers, stuff like that. It just it feels like whenever the jump happens, I don't know how much of this is like performative self-hatred or what. The three people that Vosh mentions the online left wrongfully jumping to defend are Professor Flowers, Luna Oi, and Chaos is Mel. There's a common factor between the three of them that I don't believe he recognized here. It's not just that the three of them are small POC creators and online figures, it's that all of their most visible online moments have been fights with Vosh. They've debated him or critiqued him in videos on Twitter. Twitter or live on stream. They have challenged his standing in the space in one way or another. And whether or not you personally agree with their positions or ideas, leftists jumping to defend them surely can't all be doing so because they want to look woke, right? Like, go watch any of these videos and come back and tell me if you don't find any issues with the way he conducts himself. Online interactions are complicated, yes, and Vosh can't be blamed for everything that goes wrong with them. But it's just dishonest to act like there's no pattern here. And so you might notice that Based on how he has framed this phenomenon, with Luna, Mel, and Professor Flowers being the online left's non-white false prophets, something else is implied. In the same way that they are all connected by having challenged Vosh, the small POC creators are connected by not doing that. I don't mean to suggest that this is intentional, that they're playing nice for a host or a raid or whatever, but this still begs the question. If any of them were to end up fighting with Vosh on the big stage, as Professor Flowers, Luna Oi, and Mel did, and have it go the way these interactions went, would he still hold them in the same regard? If the online left jumped to defend them, would it be another case of the id poll Twitter lefties conspiring against him? Would they then become the worst ones? The worst ones. The irony here is that when someone in the chat asks him for the actual names of the smaller underappreciated POC creators he's talking about, this is how he responds. Want to name some of the cool ones you're thinking of? I should do a list. I'll, I'll do a list. I'll do a list sometime. I could pull that together. I need to find a way to access my old like Twitch stuff though, because my Twitch account got deleted, you know? Um, so. He doesn't mention them for the rest of that video. This isn't meant to be a gotcha. This is firstly to say, Bosch, if you're watching this right now on stream, have you made the list yet? If not, you now have my permission to pause and do that and then share it with your stream and refill your nuggies and pay me some money. Seriously. Cash, I need cash. Gimme, 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 gimme.
But more importantly, I feel like this is another more subtle example of the way white supremacy operates online. Vosh says that he enjoys all these POC creators work as a counterpoint to dunk on the people that disagree with him. But when it comes time to actually do the thing that would help them the most, he fails. This might seem like a trivial thing, and perhaps he has mentioned them on his stream before. I don't know, I can't watch every minute of every one. But they aren't mentioned here when there's a perfect opportunity to do so. And I don't think it's reading too far into it to say that this might say something about his understanding of the space. If you truly recognize how much more difficult it is to make it as a content creator when you're not white, from the racially biased algorithm, to the majority white audience demographics, to the material conditions necessary to enable you to even attempt creating content in the first place, then you should be taking every opportunity to fight against these forces. Especially when you get an easy alley-oop like that from your chat. This sort of built-in racial gatekeeping of left tube by Vosh and others is something that I don't think gets talked about enough. They have deemed this their movement, and in order to be a part of it, you have to play by their rules. If you don't, you're gonna end up fighting a tidal wave of debate bros in your Twitter mentions and comment sections for the entirety of your potentially short-lived career. This is not good or healthy or inclusive. Speaking of which, at the beginning Beginning when Xander Hall responds to that comment about black creators, he also doesn't actually even read that list. He saw the name of a black creator he doesn't like and then started foaming at the fucking mouth. I'm so glad you brought this up! Just leftist things. The names on that list were Khadija Umbo, FD Signifier, Shanspear, Foreign Man in a Foreign Land, Yara Zaid, and T Noir. You're probably already subscribed to most of the people on that list, seeing as they're like three times my size. But I do want to give a special shout out to Foreign. He's genuinely one of the funniest people on here. Uh, and if you're not sub, to him, well, you're missing out. Get this man to 100k thousand or I will go sicko mode and no I will not elaborate on what I mean by that. Also, Foreign and I will be doing a music jam session live stream this weekend, 11 a.m. specific time. Be there or be cringe. With this last point, I should be very clear that this problem is not unique to Vosh or even Debate Bros. As a matter of fact, in this video here, where lefty streamer Shark300 talks with FD Signifier about break bread, Shark mentions that he's only ever been promoted by a video essayist once. This is in contrast with the numerous times that the streaming community has promoted him. People like Lance from The Surfs or The Humanist Report, and even some of our debate bro besties like Xander Hall and Vosh. This problem is much bigger than any individual or group, let alone any faction of the online left content creation space. But I don't think it hurts to start by pointing out structures that seem to be actively fighting against inclusivity. Structures like the format of online debate content or something like that. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm so tired, man. Let's get to the conclusion. <laughs> Do I think Vosh is racist? What does answering that question solve? There's nothing that Vosh has said about or done to Professor Flowers that his followers, orbiters, and vulturistic little underlings Hey, don't be a dick. Most of whom are self-described leftists haven't been ready to accept more or less at face value and then spread across the internet. The fact that this was able to happen with so little pushback in a space that considers itself the left should be concerning to all of us. No amount of charity streams, Shapiro dunks, or leftist creator platform growth will make up for the fact that white supremacy is the default. It is the status quo, and unless we are challenging it in all places and at all times, then we are playing a role in sustaining it. After the Professor Flowers debate, Vosh brought on the indigenous activist Morgan Khashoggi to talk about land back, a conversation which I've mentioned throughout this video. It is an objectively good thing that he did this, as she was able to educate him and his audience about that movement. But the thing is, this only happened as a direct response to the Professor Flowers debate. The upload came days after the debate and served primarily to reinforce to himself and his audience that he had won. If you think I'm being cynical there, then I would just ask you this. Why is that conversation the first and only time he's ever spoken with an indigenous activist on his stream, and only one of the two videos out of the 1,241 that he's posted on his channel that even mentions the issue of land back? Once again, we see the structure of online white supremacy, co-opting indigenous and non-white perspectives when it serves him, but leaving them out for the rest of the time. 
I don't see what's happened here as being the product of malicious actions of individuals. Rather, I would define the source as a flawed system of knowledge creation, upheld by individuals who are unable to recognize those flaws due to their own unchallenged biases, homogenous environments, and stagnant consumption habits. Only one of those definitions allows us to actually address the problem. Well, there's probably other ways, but that last one sounded good when I wrote it and sounded horrible when I said it out loud. With that being said, stop watching debate content. Seriously, just stop. I was gonna add the caveat that it's okay to do if you're doing it strictly for entertainment purposes. But even then, if you're doing that, you're supporting a system that encourages individualistic domination and has repeatedly resulted in the sustained harassment of racialized creators. In poll, in poll, in poll. I know you're not gonna listen and that's fine, but that is my final prescription on the matter. If you don't wanna do that though, then at the very least, it's probably a good idea that you follow and listen to more non-white, non-Western creators. Especially if people like Vosh are talking about them like this. I'm starting to wonder if you're educated enough to have this conversation. That's a good sign that maybe something is missing from the analysis. Perhaps a perspective? Sorry for the id poll. Sorry for existing. But also I should be clear that coming into non-debate spaces with debate bro brain can cause issues. So I'm sentencing you all to a mandatory three month period of viewing this content without interacting before you jump into any comment sections in devil's advocate mode. I mentioned this video before, but I want to highlight this again because it's an example of a way that creators can be a part of the solution. The streamer Shark300 has a video on his channel where, after criticizing FD's break bread live on his stream, FD showed up in the chat and asked if he could call in to discuss. And they ended up talking it out, and it turned into a really good conversation. They were able to find some common ground and better understand the perspective of either side of the debate essayist rift. Now, this isn't always a possibility. Some environments are more hostile than others. But whenever stuff like this happens, it shows me that this problem is not terminal. There are good people on here trying their best to learn and understand each other, and that gives me hope. I would like to foster a space where we can all grow and share ideas and perspectives, and I think it's possible, but debate content is antithetical to this goal if it is being taken as a serious form of inquiry, which it clearly is by many. So stop it. Please stop. I haven't talked about this publicly anywhere, but one of the things that started all of this was when I posted my left tube guide. In that video, I promoted both Professor Flowers and Vosh because I liked both of their content. And when it blew up, Vosh fans ended up reaching her channel and her Twitter, where she had criticized them before, and I think that's partly what prompted her first response video. So I've watched all of this happen with one foot on either side of the divide, having a new influx of viewers and supporters, many of whom were Vosh fans, while simultaneously watching what they were doing and how it was hurting people. I was a small content creator, Still not that confident in my ability to articulate why what was happening bothered me so much. I've attempted this script roughly once a month since September, but I was never able to find the right words or had what I felt like was the right opportunity. But then Xander Hall went and said that dumb shit. Noah Samson's a fucking idiot. And I'm glad he did, because it kicked my repression brain back into gear to be able to make this. And it's especially funny, given that Xander Hall is the reason I'd found Professor Flowers in the first place, all the way back in August, through a video response she made to him, where he was, you guessed it, saying more dumb shit. I think that a leftist who used to be a reactionary and is now progressive is a more effective leftist than someone who's been a leftist their whole lives. I will die on that hill. And you know why? It's because people who used to be alt-righters, people who used to be Nazis, they heard all the arguments, all the arguments, all the beliefs that Nazis and alt-righters have. And in the end, they still realized it was all wrong. Do you think that we have it? So it feels very full circle, you know? Never change, buddy. Debate bro lol cow destroyed once again in the marketplace of Joe Mama. I'm joking, by the way. Please don't take any of this seriously. If you think political content creator beef is interesting in any capacity, you need to go outside. But first, stop watching debate streams. Stop it. Stop. Anyways, that's it, everyone. Hope you liked it. Sorry if it was a bit harsh at points, but, uh, you know, I just tried to be honest. So now that I've said all that I need to say, I can finally retire from Debate Bros discourse for real this time. And you have no idea how happy that makes me. I'm free free at last. I am willing to come onto any streams to discuss specific disagreements with claims that I made in this video, but make a list with timestamps and have it ready or I will leave the call. Other than that, leave me alone forever. Thanks. Uh, but but, but, but one, one, more, one more thing. There's currently about 100,000 people in Hawaii whose water supply has been poisoned with jet fuel by the US Navy and their Red Hill fuel storage facility. On November 28th, Sunday, it definitely smelled like I was in a gas station pumping my gas in my car. That's how I knew 
something was wrong. Not only is the Navy refusing to do anything about this, but they are actively sweeping the problem under the rug by lying about further water contamination and just a few days ago filing a counter lawsuit to keep the reserves open after the state of Hawaii ordered them shut down. This has been years in the making, but people first started getting sick in December, just three months ago, and now no mainstream sources are covering it. Please click the first link in the description of this video. It'll take you to a webpage with instructions on writing a letter to the Department of Defense. They've made it pretty straightforward and there are templates and talking points. Talk about this with the people around you, share that link, and follow Oahu Water Protectors on Twitter to stay up to date with everything going on. It's a mass poisoning of indigenous people and land by an imperialist military power. And we don't like that on this channel. All right. Thank you so much to my patrons as always. I'll try to be faster at videos, but um, brain. So I'm gonna close the video out by playing this little song that I made with clips from the beginning. You might've seen it, I tweeted it. It's not supposed to be beef. It's just, I think it's funny and catchy and fun. And yeah, okay. Bye. By colonizer, I'm using it as a dog whistle for white. By colonizer, I'm using it as a dog whistle for white. Colonizer, I'm using it as a dog whistle for white. Yeah. Dog whistle for white. Okay. Castrated whiteies. If anyone says Vosh is wrong, they're defending genocide. If anyone says Vosh is wrong, they're defending genocide. Damn. I have no problem with black creators getting really big. However, whiteies who just refuse to disagree with women of color. You're either anti-genocide or pro-woke genocide. You're either pro-genocide or castrated whiteies. whiteies. You're either anti-genocide or pro-woke genocide. If anyone says Vosh is wrong, they're defending genocide. Noah, Noah Sampson, the coward, the coward doesn't seem to care, doesn't, doesn't seem to care. Castrated white. I have no problem with black creators getting really big. However, FD signifier is a dumb fuck. What? Hassan Piker is an idiot. Hassan Piker is not very good at defending his position. What? I have no problem with black creators getting really big. However, However, cast cast rate by whiteies. colonizer, I'm using it as a dog whistle for white. By colonizer, I'm using it as a dog whistle for dog whistle for white. There are a lot dog of people of color who believe that lack liberation is going to come by ostracizing white people from the movement. <laughs> that was sus. Mommy milkers.